Well, today we are going to finish our series, preaching series on the Lord's Prayer. And so let me just read our passage from today. Uh, The text comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are made to praise. And that may be more apparent in some of us than others. And I'll, and I'll give you just one illustration from, from my life. I've always been a huge sports fan. I enjoy following sports, and especially Auburn sports, where I went to college. But even before I got to college, I liked following Auburn sports. I would try to watch or listen to every Auburn football game and basketball game. And in fact, I was so committed to watching or listening to Auburn games, I'll tell you a story. When I was 11 years old, my family on a Saturday made a a very special trip to Montgomery, which was about an hour away, and we were planning to go and spend a significant amount of the day day at Toys R Us. Toys R Us. Now, that may not be a huge deal to you, but to me, who lived in a small town, that was a trip we made like maybe once or twice a year. And so my brother and I, we looked forward to that big time every year. And so, but the day of the Toys R Us trip, Toys R Us trip was also the day that Auburn was playing a game. And when we arrived at the Toys R Us that day, the game was in the fourth quarter, and it was a close game. And so I begged my parents. I said, you can go into Toys R Us with my brother, but let me stay in the car to listen to the end of the Auburn game as an 11-year-old. And you know what? They let me do it. <laughs> they, after I, I cajoled them, you know, I, they, I talked them into it, and they went in, and I stayed in the car. And, and just so you, let, let, me, let me make sure you understood that. An 11-year-old boy ignored, ignored Toys R Us to listen to the end of a football game. That's how big of a fan I was. Now, I don't want to talk about how that game ended. It wasn't good. And Toys R Us was a little comfort afterwards, by the way. Um, But that should illustrate to you what a big Auburn fan I I was. And and you're just like me. I mean, maybe you you haven't ignored a Toys R Us trip to listen to the end of a game, but but, but you you were made to be a fan. You were made to praise. It may not be a sports team. It may be a musician that you love or an author that you follow or an artist of some kind. Perhaps it's a a leader that you admire or a business that you appreciate. Uh, Bottom line, we're all designed to be fans, to to praise. And, and, And God made us that way. He made us to praise. And specifically, God made us to praise Him. That's what the Bible tells us. The early chapters of Genesis teach us that God made us in his image and he made us to be his worshipers. And then all through the Bible, you read stories about people praising God all over the place. And then in the New Testament, we read that all things were made by and for Christ to bring praise to him. Praising God, this is what we were made for. Yet often, we don't do that. We don't praise God. Instead, we uh, you know, think of praising other things, and we're, uh, we have desires and we're uh, are, are impressed by other things other than God. Now, it's not wrong to be a fan of a sports team or of an artist or of a, uh, an author or something like that. I mean, we can certainly take it too far, but it's not wrong, per se, to be uh, a fan of something. But the one who ought to get the most praise, the one we ought to be admiring the most, is certainly our God. And so today, as we conclude our series on the Lord's Prayer, we're going to be talking about the doxology of that prayer. The word doxology just doxology simply means a statement of praise. And that's exactly what that phrase is. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Um, that is a statement of praise. And so we're going to look at this doxology and how it teaches us to praise God. And so here's the outline of the sermon today. We're going to first talk about the situation of the text in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And then we're going to talk about how God is praised in the doxology that we just read uh, at the end of the Lord's Prayer. And then finally, we'll talk about how we are to respond by praising God and what that looks like in our lives each day. So first, before we analyze the doxology, we need to talk about a textual issue there at the end of the Lord's Prayer. So again, here's verse 13. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours 
is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, I want you to notice that the verse up on the screen has the last part of the Lord's Prayer in brackets. Now, why is that so, you may ask? Well, that's, it is that way because those words do not actually appear in the text of the English Standard Version of the Bible. And in fact, they don't appear in many of your translations of the Bible. If you have a Bible, you can open up there and look and see. Some of your Bibles may have it. Many of them don't. And the reason that those words don't appear is because the earliest and best Greek manuscripts that we have of the New Testament do not have these words in them. And therefore, many scholars believe, and I agree, that these words were actually not a part of the prayer that Matthew recorded that Jesus taught his disciples. Now, I realize this brings up a lot of questions in your mind. Questions about manuscripts of the New Testament, you know, and, and is the Bible reliable then if one manuscript says one thing and another says another? And so what I want to do is actually take a few minutes and talk about those things. I first want to talk about the New Testament itself, the manuscripts we have, and, and, and a little bit about that in general. And then I want to talk about this passage and how we analyze this particular question. And so first, let me start by talking about the manuscripts of the New Testament. We have no original manuscripts of the New Testament. None of them. They were written about 2,000 years ago, and none of the originals that we have, the, the originals survive. But what we do have is copies, lots of handwritten copies, manuscripts. Now, you may think, but wait a minute, if we don't have the originals, then how can we know that the Bible that we have is reliable? Well, the answer to that question is that the New Testament is extremely reliable, and there are two main reasons that the, the, the New Testament that we have is reliable. Number one, we have a huge number of early manuscripts, copies of the New Testament books, and there is a lack of major variations in those manuscripts. So let me talk about those things. First, the New Testament is by far the most reliable ancient document that we have. And the reason is because we have so many copies of it. Let me just give you a comparison. There was a Roman historian named Tacitus. Tacitus wrote in the first century AD around the same time that the books of the New Testament were being written. We have exactly three copies of his work, three of them. And the earliest of those copies is from the ninth century AD, at least 700 years after the original was written. That's Tacitus. We also have the writings of a historian named Livy. Livy was, uh, uh, also wrote in the first century, and we have many more copies of his work. We have 27, a ton of them, right? We have 27 copies of Livy's work, and the earliest of which is from the fourth century AD. So that's just a couple of hundred years, probably after they were originally written. Now, listen to this. Of the New Testament, we have currently found over 5,700 handwritten manuscripts, New Testaments, or portions of the New Testament. And they date back to, the earliest date back to the first century AD, within decades of when they were originally written. And this number, 5,700, by the way, does not include the hundreds of quotations of the New Testament that we have in the writings of the early church leaders known as the church fathers. And so with all these copies and witnesses of the New Testament, we have a great chance of figuring out what it was that Matthew originally wrote. Now, let me make one more comparison just to give you confidence. Scholars believe that the New Testament, the reliability of the New Testament is far greater than the reliability of the works of Shakespeare. <laughs> Shakespeare wrote a little over 400 years ago and, and, and Shakespeare scholars will tell you that in every one of his writings, there are probably around a hundred places where we're not sure what he originally wrote. And they affect the meaning of the story greatly. Now compare that to the New Testament, where 
there are, certainly there are disagreements among the manuscripts. We're looking at one of them this morning. But those disagreements are minor disagreements, and they're usually over matters like spelling and the use of synonyms and word order. For example, some manuscripts may have the Lord Jesus Christ, while others have Christ Jesus the Lord. Hardly a substantive difference there between those two. And only in a handful of places are there major differences, and even in those places, no major doctrine of our faith is affected. So, because we have so many early manuscripts with so few disagreements, we can have a lot of confidence in the New Testament that what we have is what was originally written. Bottom line, the Greek New Testament that we have, the English translations that you have are very reliable. Now, for those passages where there are differences in the manuscripts of the New Testament, we go through a process known as textual criticism. What textual criticism does is it attempts to discover what the original document that was written by Matthew or by the New Testament authors says. And generally, we use two criteria to help figure out what was originally written when there are disagreements in the manuscripts. The two criteria are external evidence, internal evidence. External evidence is what do the manuscripts say? And what we do is we look especially at the earliest and and best manuscripts to see what they say because the early manuscripts haven't been copied as many times, right? So that's external evidence. Then there's internal evidence. What of the, of the options there, the differences, the two, the two different readings or two or more different readings, which one makes the most sense in the context of the book of the Bible? Now, what you might think is, well, we should take the reading that sounds the best, but that's actually the opposite of what we should do. What scholars w- will do is they will say, let's prefer the more difficult reading. Now, why would we do that? Well, because a scribe, a copier, is much more likely to try to correct and make it sound better than he would be or she would be to make it sound more difficult. Now, of course, if the reading is so difficult it makes no sense, then we don't want to do that. But when both readings make sense, we prefer the more difficult reading because that's probably what was original. All right, so now let's apply all of that to our passage, Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. We've got this doxology. Yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Is that a part of the prayer that Matthew recorded? Well, first of all, let's look at the manuscripts. Now, I'm not gonna, we're not going to look at them right here, but, but if you do the research, what the scholars will say is that the earliest and best manuscripts that we have of Matthew do not have this last part of the Lord's Prayer in it, that doxology in it. Now, some of the later manuscripts have it, But there are also later manuscripts that have different doxologies. For example, some of them have the words that I read to you a moment ago. But some of them say this, um, for yours is, where did I put it here? Oh yeah, Some 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 of them say, for yours is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. They have a different doxology there. And so the external evidence, when you look at the manuscripts, the earliest, best manuscripts don't have it, and the later ones have different doxologies. So that would lead us to believe that it was not a part of Matthew's gospel. Now, what about the internal evidence? Well, that also argues that we should leave this part of the prayer out. Think about this. It is much more likely that a scribe would add a doxology like this to the end of the prayer than take it away, right? Why would you leave out, for yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever? That sounds awesome. It's a great ending to a prayer. In fact, a lot of prayers in the Bible end with a doxology. But but it's it's, it's far more likely that a scribe would add that because you you would never take that out. And so the more difficult reading is to believe that the prayer is to say that the prayer ended with deliver us from evil. And so that also argues that this last part is not a part of Matthew's gospel. So now I think we have to ask this question. Where did it come from? (laughs) If it wasn't a part of Matthew's gospel, where did it come from? Well, most scholars believe that the early church recited the Lord's Prayer in worship services together. And as a part of praying that prayer in their services, it's possible that they added this doxology to it. Well, where did they get it from? 
Well, they got it from the Bible. Uh, in fact, let me read to you a passage, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 11 and 12. What I'm going to read is part of a prayer that David prayed when he was dedicating gifts that the Jewish leaders gave to the uh, uh, construction of the temple. Listen to these words and see if they sound familiar to you. Yours, O Lord, this is uh, 1 Chronicles 29, 11 and 12. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in all the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now that sounds a lot like yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever, right? Now we don't know for sure, but probably what the early church did is they added that doxology that we're reading to the last part of the prayer. And then as copies of Matthew's gospel went around, a copyist would see it there and they would add in that doxology thinking that it should be a part of the prayer since that is what they prayed in church. And that would also explain why there are different doxologies in different manuscripts because there may have been different endings to the prayer in different churches in the early centuries. Now, if all of this is true, and if that prayer was not a part of what Matthew originally wrote, you may ask the question, why do we still make this doxology a part of the Lord's prayer? Well, historically, here's why. Because the most significant English translation, historically speaking, the King James Version included it in Matthew 6, 13. If you have a King James Version, you will see it. It's there in the text of the King James Version. And so that's why it is often included in English worship services as a part of this prayer. Last question then. If yours is the kingdom, power, and glory forever, amen, was not a part of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, is it wrong to pray it? And the answer to that question, I would say, is no. In fact, I pray it all the time. And we are about to, to look at that doxology and talk about it together. And here's why I think it's okay and, in fact, good to end the prayer and to pray it. Number one, we don't know for sure that it was not a part of the Lord's Prayer. Now, we look at the manuscript evidence, we look at the internal evidence, and we think it's pretty clear that it wasn't. But we don't have the original of Matthew's Gospel, so we don't know for sure. So there needs to be a little humility there. But then secondly, the second reason it's okay is because this doxology is consistent with all of the rest of Scripture. It's not unbiblical at all. In fact, it's about as biblical as you can get to say that God belongs the kingdom, power, and glory forever. That's right in line with Scripture, even a passage that we read earlier. And so, yes, we can pray this. Yes, we can study it. And in fact, that's what we're going to do now. But before we do, let me just stop and and briefly summarize what I've covered here the last few minutes. Sometimes manuscripts in the New Testament disagree with one another, but that doesn't mean that our Bible is unreliable. In fact, the opposite is true. We have an overwhelming number of early manuscripts of the New Testament, and there are very few disagreements, none which affect major doctrine. And in this particular case, the last part of the Lord's Prayer is probably not a part of Matthew's gospel when it was written originally. But we can still pray it <laughs> because it is certainly consistent with Scripture and we see prayers like it all over the Bible. So, with all that, now let's look at this doxology, the last part of this prayer. For yours is the kingdom and power and glory forever. Amen. Now, this prayer attributes three things to God. And I want to look at each of those things. First of all, the kingdom. The prayer says that the kingdom belongs to God. Now, we talked about God's kingdom a few weeks ago when we looked at your kingdom come, your will be done. And then we said that God's kingdom refers to his reign or his rule over his people. And I told you a few weeks ago the story of God's kingdom. I said, better than giving you a definition, I should tell you the story of it. And that story involved five movements, creation, creation, 
fall, inauguration, growth, and consummation. We talked about how at creation, it was God's design. He made people, the first man and woman in his image, and then he, he told them to go and to fill the earth with his worshipers, but they fell. They disobeyed God, but God did not give up on his kingdom. He continued to make promises to his people, to people like Abraham and Moses and David and the nation of Israel. And, and, but even though God continued to make promises time after time, people failed. And so what was going to happen to God's kingdom? Well, it was kind of unsure until, you know, from a human perspective until Christ Jesus came and he inaugurated God's kingdom. He brought it and he, and he inaugurated it through his, his teaching ministry, his healings, his, his, his miracles that he performed. Uh, and, and then he inaugurated in the fullest sense when he died sacrificially for us, for sinners, and then he was raised from the dead. He brought God's kingdom in that sense. And now that kingdom is growing. The message of his salvation and his kingdom is going out and many are believing. And one day when Jesus returns to rule, that kingdom will find its final consummation on a new heavens and new earth. That's the story of God's kingdom. And it's very different from human kingdoms. And we can't, we can't forget that. That God's kingdom, it's eternal, it's forever, and it's different than human kingdoms. I really like how R.C. Sproul contrasted the United States form of government with the form of government in God's kingdom. And I think it's, it's good for us to hear this. Uh, Sproul wrote about how our form of government is a social contract where the people agree to be governed for the good of society. And this is what Sproul said about our form of government. He said, people must agree to surrender some rights to the government for the benefit of social order. This theory undergirds the idea that legitimate government authority stems from the consent of the governed. For this reason, the United States is said to have a government of the people, by the people, for the people. But, Sproul concludes, not so the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not of the people, by the people, or for the people. It is a kingdom ruled by a king. And God does not rule by the consent of his subjects, but by his sovereign authority. His reign extends over me, whether I vote for him or not. I, I can't think of a better way to express yours is the kingdom. It's his. He rules. And then the prayer says, yours is the power. Now, when I think of power, I think of things like dynamite or a really big truck or an army tank or a, a grizzly bear. I think of brute strength. And, and certainly God has greater brute strength than all of those things. But think not only of God's brute strength, but think of how that Strength is exercised, namely, to save. That strength is exercised for a redemptive saving purpose. This is how J.I. Packer put it. Power is the actual mastery that God's rule shows. Not then naked, arbitrary power, like that of a tornado or a rogue elephant or a dictator, but unconquerable beneficence, triumphantly fulfilling purposes of mercy and loving kindness to us and all men. It is the power by which God is good to all and rescued Israel from Egypt and raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So to God belongs the power, but not just the raw power, the power to save. And that power is, of course, demonstrated in the greatest way through the work of Jesus, his death and resurrection to save us from sin, to conquer over sin and death, so that we could be children of God. To, his, to him is the power. And then also to him is the glory. Now, what is, what is glory? Well, it's everything wonderful about something. Now, for example, if you're watching the Olympics, the commentators in the Olympics will point out, you know, if you're watching figure skating or something like that, uh, they will point out the, the, the wonderful moves that the skaters are making and how wonderful they are and the, the difficulty of it and how they've executed it so well. What they're doing is describing 
what's wonderful, the glory of that particular skater or that particular routine. Well, God's glory, which is much greater, of course, is everything wonderful about Him, everything that's great about Him. And it, it involves His kingdom and His power, but it involves more than that. It's everything about Him that is praiseworthy. The fact that He is creator and that He has made the world and, and people and flowers and elephants and trees and, and eagles. It's, it's, it's His creativity. It's His kindness and His patience. It's that He gives us life. It's that He bears with our sins against Him. It's everything that's wonderful about Him. And His glory is manifested probably in the clearest way, in His Son. Because through Jesus and His saving work, we can actually see His glory now. Before, we couldn't see it. That's what the Bible tells us. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We couldn't see it before. But now that we have been brought back to God in Christ, we can see how great He is, how wonderful He is, and offer Him the praise He deserves. That's His glory. And then the prayer says that these three things, kingdom, power, and glory, are God's forever. Now, we don't understand forever. We don't. I'm, I, I look at my phone, and I'm trying to load a website. It's taking forever. I'm sitting in an airport. Right, I'm sitting in an airport. The plane's delayed. It's taking forever. No, it's not. It's not forever. Okay? We even think of, I don't, I don't think we think of human dynasties very well either. Kingdoms that last a long time. You know, the U.S. has enjoyed a couple of centuries and more of peaceful home rule in general. Um, there have been wars certainly, but the U.S. has been fairly consistent over the last 200 plus years. That's a long time, right? No. Here's how Arthur Pink puts it. Earthly kingdoms decay and disappear. Creaturely power is puny and but for a moment. The glory of human beings and of all mundane things vanishes like a dream, but the kingdom and power and glory of Jehovah are susceptible to neither change nor diminution, and they shall know no end. The United States will know an end. It will not last forever. I'm not being a prophet of doom here, but it's just a it's a, it's a human kingdom. It's not going to last forever. Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, they all ruled. They all ended. Modern dynasties have risen and fallen, but there is only one kingdom that will truly last forever, and it's God's. To Him be the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. And the amen is simply our confirmation, our agreement, our faith in that statement. So how do we respond to this doxology? Well, our response is clear. We are to praise God. We're to praise Him. Now, how do we do that? Well, I want to talk about four ways, four different ways that we can praise God. And I'm going to spend the most time on the first one. And it's this, desire God, desire Him. You know, as Christians, we can sometimes be critical of desires and think, oh, I'm a Christian, I can't have desires, that's bad. I can't long for things or want things. I need to be like a robot or something. Well, we can think that way as Christians sometimes, but C.S. Lewis sees it differently. This is what he said. He said, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. See, God, remember, he, he made us to worship, to adore, to be fans, to, to want 
to, to praise things. And a part of worshiping him is desiring him, is wanting him, seeking after him with all of our hearts. This is what, if you're familiar with John Piper in his book, Desiring God, that's what he was talking about. How God has made us for this, to desire him, to long for him. So if we don't desire him, if that's not happening in us, how do, how do we get it to be happening in us? What do we do? Well, first thing we do is know that God desires you and delights in you. That's one of the ways that we can grow in our desire for him. Think about it. If there are people in your life, like for example, if you had you know, parents who were good parents, they, they gave so much to you. Or if you had grandparents or, or some uncle or aunt, someone who, who gave to you a lot, that made you turn around and admire them and, and desire them and to want to, to know them and love them. Well, if you want to talk about the greatest example of loving and providing for and pursuing people, it's God and what he has done for us through Jesus. Because we were miserable sinners who mistrusted God and rejected his rule in our lives. Let's just use the word the Bible uses. We were God's enemies. And you know what God did to his enemies? He has pursued us, desired us so, so loved us that he gave his only son to die for us. And not only that, but through his son in his death and resurrection, he's adopted us into his family. He's given us new life, seated us in the heavenly places with Christ, put his own spirit, his presence in us to lead us. And he pours out his love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. God delights in us, seeks us, loves us, desires us day after day. And so in response, we can delight in him as we see how much he's given us and loves us. And another way we, we can desire God is by reading about how wonderful he is in his word. You know, I mentioned the, the commentators for the Olympic Games and how they, they talk about how, how wonderful and glorious these Olympic athletes are. Well, that's a, a good picture of what the Bible is. It's a commentary. It's a divine commentary on how great God is. That's what this book is. One way to describe it. And so as we get into it, we can read about how great God is and it can cause us to desire him more. For example, I'll just give you one example. In Psalm 23, do you know what God's word says about the way God desires you? It says there that the goodness and loving kindness of God will pursue you all the days of your life. That's a Hebrew word that's used in other contexts to talk about how enemies pursue other enemies in a battle. But, but it's not enemies pursuing us. It's God's goodness and love chasing us, pursuing us. Look at God's word. See how he delights in you. Let your desires for him grow through that. And then just spend time thinking about how wonderful he is. I don't know about you, but my thoughts go everywhere all kinds of places, all the time. And it's, and it's usually not to God by default. They just go, thinking about whatever's in front of me or whatever's going on. Instead of letting our thoughts go where they might, let's direct them to God and think about how great He is and let that cause us to desire Him more. And so these are all ways that we can desire Him, delight in Him more, praise Him. Now, very briefly, let me go over three ways, three other ways we can praise God. A second, we can actually offer him praise and worship, corporately and individually. Corporately, that's what we're doing right now. We're hearing the preaching of his word. We're singing songs together, dedicating children. Other Sundays, we'll take communion or have baptisms. We're giving. All these are expressions of our worship and praise of God. And so doing that weekly, regularly, this is something we should not forsake, but do consistently. Also, praising him on your own in your prayer life, as you're going about your day, singing a song of praise in your mind or out loud, if you'd like, to Him, praising Him. Practice that worship in your life. A third way that we can praise Him is we can have confidence that He will answer prayer. 
You know, part of the reason I think this doxology has found its way into the Lord's prayer is that it reinforces the prayer. Think about it. If we're asking God to provide our daily bread, to forgive our sins, to give us the grace to forgive others, to deliver us from evil, what this doxology reminds us is that we're asking, the one we're asking to do these things can do them. He has the power to do them. His is the kingdom. His is the glory. And so let this doxology give you confidence that as you go to God in prayer, He will answer prayer. And let it give you confidence to depend on Him. And then a final way that we can praise God is surrender ourselves to Him. Surrender yourself to Him. Remember, we said from the beginning of this uh, look at the Lord's Prayer a few weeks ago, That prayer is not about us and our agenda, but it's about God and His agenda for us. Well, the closing of this prayer is a good reminder of that. That prayer is about God's kingdom and power and glory. That it's not about our kingdom and power and glory. It's about God's. Therefore, our lives are His. And we are to obey Him, serve Him, honor Him, be about His kingdom work. And so let this prayer remind you of that and cause you to to give your life to Him. That you would be His witness as He's called you to be. That you would live a life of repentance and obedience to Him. Serving Him, moving forward His kingdom in your life. Giving yourself daily to Him. So in conclusion, let me invite you to please stand and pray with me. And let us close this sermon and this series together, praying in the way that the Lord has taught us. I will lead us in just a moment. 